Please turn in your Bibles to Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, O Lord, kept the record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Though with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love. And with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. This is the word of God. Well, please stay open there in Psalm 130. We have a break from Esther as it is the holidays and I've chosen this psalm to look at tonight. Let's pray before we get into it. Father, we thank you for this time now to slow down from our week, from the busyness of life, to worship you and to look at your word and sit under it. And you know how much we need it. You know how much we need the encouragement and the correction that your word brings. And so we pray, God, that you would give it right now and that you would bring it to our lives. Father, we pray that you would Equip us with the energy that we need right now to listen. Uh, Equip us with the ears to hear. And as well, God, with a heart that desires to submit to your word. And we pray that we would be transformed by your word, humbled and ready to obey it and keep it. And I pray, God, that you would give me strength to share your word clearly and share it truly. And we pray all of this for your glory. Amen. Well, there are moments, aren't there, where you feel like you're stuck in a deep, dark valley of despair. Moments where you would describe your life as being, as though being in a bottomless pit, alone and helpless. Seasons where you feel as though you're in the depths of a tumultuous ocean because of everything that life is throwing at you. Or times where you just feel like the darkness in life isn't going to pass, where light and joy seem as though they don't exist. Are you in a season right now like that? Or are you ready for a season like that? Because they will come. Seasons like that will come. What are we to do when the depths of guilt, sin, shame, misery crowd over us? What are we to do when life has brought us down into a deep, dark hole of despondency, of difficulty, of depression? What will pull us up from this? to the heights of joy and hope in God. Well, in Psalm 130, the psalmist here, he was in that kind of situation. And in it, we see here what he does to rise from those depths, rise from the depths of despair and rise to the peak of joy and hope in God. Psalm 130, if you look just before verse 1, it says there at the beginning, a song of ascents. This psalm is what the Jews would have sung as they ascended up to Jerusalem, the holy hill, ready to celebrate festivals like the Passover and other festivals. And they would sing it as they went up from the depths of their sin and daily life and ascended up to the hilltop, to Jerusalem, where they were going to worship God and celebrate Him in their festivals. And I want to take that, that imagery of climbing, that imagery, imagery of climbing, and use it to help us understand this psalm. In this sermon, I want you to picture climbing a mountain as we go through it, and I hope you will see it in the psalm. Because we see here in the psalm a progression from despair in verse 1 to hope and worship in verse 7 and 8. And we see in that progression four steps to make that climb. If you desire in your life, if you want to rise from the depths of despair and rise up to hope and joy in the Lord, then you need to make these things here in this passage a habit in your life. 
But before we look at them, we, we first need to ask the question about this psalm, we need to ask, what depths is the psalmist in? To make sure we apply it properly and understand it properly, we need to know, what depths is the psalmist in? Well, the word for depths in verse 1 I'm talking about there, it literally refers to deep waters, a place of life-threatening danger. And it's pretty clear, I think, that the danger this the psalmist is in is in him. It's his sin. Verse 2, this is why he pleads for mercy in verse 2, because of his sin. This is why he confesses the depths of sin in verse 3, and why he talks about forgiveness in verse 4. The depths is sin. Despair over his sin is clearly what troubles him. And sin is what mainly stops us as well from reaching the height of joy or hope in God. But even though the psalm, that's the particular focus of the psalmist in dealing with the depths of sin and how we respond to the depths of sin and guilt, I think what we see in this psalm and the the steps that we see in this psalm can also similarly be used for any pit that we find ourselves ourselves in. They can be used in the despair that we will find ourselves in, in depression or sickness or hardship or any other kind of difficulty. So let's get into it. And we're going, to, uh, we're going to answer that question, what should we do as the guilt of sin drowns us or as we're stuck in a dark season in our life? What should, should we do? Come with me now as we make the climb through Psalm 130. So the first thing we see we must do to make this climb is we must cry to the Lord. Verse 1 and 2 show we must cry to the Lord. In our mountain picture, we begin here down in the valley of despair down in the valley of pain. And we often have moments like this, don't we? But unfortunately, the problem is, in these moments, as proud people, people who are self-sufficient, our first instinct in those moments isn't to run to the Lord, is it? Instead, we run to what we can do. But we need to realize that self-help, self-pity, building up your self-esteem, or even running to the help of others is not the way to climb out of the pit of our troubles or the pit of our sin. It's not the way. We need to battle that tendency in us because it's often what we want to run to doing, but it's not the way. Instead, we need to desperately cry out to God. That's what the psalmist first runs to doing. And he does it with desperation and urgency. Have a look, verse 1 and 2. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord... O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. So we see the psalmist, he's crying to God, he's crying out to God, but he's also calling out twice for God to hear him, to hear his cries and to listen to him. This is what our prayers and our repentance need need to look like as well, this kind of desperation. We need to cry out over our sin, cry out for mercy like The psalmist in Psalm 51 does, have mercy on me, O God. We need to cry out for mercy. So when we're down in the deep depths because of our sin, or because of something else, we need to cry out to God to be rescued. We need to cry out for His favour and for His mercy. And this is what the psalmist does. And no matter how little you think that depth or that sin may be, or how deep that condition of sin is, you must cry to, to God, because only He can work to change it. And nothing is too great for Him. Crying out to Him is your only hope. And, and we know this, don't we? When you picture a pit, or being stuck in a depth, something deep, you can't do anything on your own to get out. You need help. You need to cry out for help to get out, and this is what we must do. But we don't cry out to the help of others. We must cry out to the help of God. And until we cry out, we will be stuck there. We will be stuck there. So when God puts you in those depths, when God puts you in difficulty, you need to realize that He's putting you there in that moment to humble you. It's a humbling moment. And it's a wake-up call as well for us to cry out to God to not rely on ourselves, but to call out to Him. And that's 
what the psalmist does. And so we must do as well. We must do this too. Cry out to God in desperation because only He can change the difficulty that we're facing. And that's the way out of the valley of despair. That's the way to stop us from sinking further into that bog that we might be in, crying out to God. Psalm 40, verse 1 and 2 says a similar thing. It says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. So when we are in the depths of despair, cry to God. He can lift you up. What else must we do, though, to make this climb from the depths? Well, secondly, we must confess our sins. In verse 3 and 4, we're going to see this. Here in this, the mountain picture that we're looking at, as we climb up that mountain, here I, I see that we come to the pathway to forgiveness, confession of sin. Have a look at verse 3. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? What's the answer? No one. No one could stand. Very clearly. Absolutely no one. No one could stand right before God. No one could stand confident that no accusations would be brought against them. If God was to deal justly with all of us, we are all ruined. We are all ruined. Romans says, for all have sinned. And fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. If we get what we deserve, we are ruined. And we have no hope because we cannot justify our sin and what we've done. We cannot plead innocence before God. We cannot conceal our sin before the all-seeing God. Instead, the way out is to acknowledge it and to confess it. And I think that's what we're seeing there in the psalmist. He's recognizing the depths of sin. But not only does he recognize the depths of sin, he is broken by sin. Have a think in your own mind. If God counted your sin, all your sin, and never forgot it, would you, in response to that thought, say, I cannot stand right before him. I am ruined. Would you be in agony like you see the psalmist there in verse 3? Because that's how we should feel, because of our sin. Helpless. And because of that helplessness, it should lead us to confess. Confess that state before God. And that is so essential. Confession is so essential because that leads to crying out for forgiveness and for mercy. That acknowledgement of sin and that confession leads to crying out for mercy and forgiveness. That's what we see in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, where it talks about confession leading to forgiveness. And Richard Sibbs, the writer says, the way to cover our sin is to uncover it by confession. The path to forgiveness comes first by following that path of confession. And that's what we see there as well. The progression from verse 3 to verse 4 shows us that same progression. Because what follows? Verse 3 is the hope of forgiveness. Look at verse 4. But with you, God, there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. So after verse 3 here, a big but comes. Because if verse 3 was on its own, it would leave us trembling. It should leave us shaking and trembling. But verse 4 comes, there is forgiveness with God. There is forgiveness. He does not consume us in His anger. He forgives and shows mercy. He forgives by paying the debt in crushing his son. And it's not just this cheap forgiveness that he just throws around. No, it's actually a forgiveness as well that then transforms us. Have a look at verse 4 again. It says, But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Or so that you could translate there, there is forgiveness so that you are feared. God brings forgiveness into our lives so that He is feared, so that He is worshipped, so that He is served and revered. Do you realize that, that that confession is the pathway to forgiveness and that leads to worship and to service? Confession of sin readies us to worship God. 
confession of sin and then the forgiveness that we find in Christ readies us to worship God and to serve Him. That's the progression. So if we are to climb from the climb to that peak, up to that peak of joy, we must follow this path of confessing sin and finding forgiveness in Christ. Until you do that, you will never be ready to find hope in God and find joy in Him. Until that is done, you will never be ready to find joy in any of your troubles until confession of sin and the forgiveness that you can have is found. But thirdly, how do we climb up from the pit of despair, from the depths. How do we climb up? The third thing we are to do is to crave for God to work. Here in that mountain climbing picture, I picture this point as being at the base camp of the mountain. There's one key thing that must be done before we can ascend up to that peak of hope, and it's waiting. Patiently waiting, that base camp. And it's a waiting that is anticipating and craving and longing for something. Look at verse 5 and 6. The psalmist says, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in His word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. What's the psalmist waiting for? Well, he's waiting to be pulled from the depths that he said he was in in verse 1 and enjoy the hope that's found in God that he's going he's to get in verse 7 and 8. He's waiting for that. The psalmist, he already has forgiveness. Verse 4 showed us that. But he's waiting still for that full restoration and that full joy and hope in the Lord. And just like climbers, we must wait. Climbers wait at the at base camp of a mountain. They wait at the base camp of a mountain until it is the right time to ascend, don't they? They have to wait until it is the, there's the right conditions to be able to ascend to the mountain peak. If you've ever watched a, a documentary on Mount Everest, you would know that. They have to wait until the conditions are right, but they also have to wait for another reason. They have to wait so that their bodies are adjusted and ready for that climb. And as we ascend from the depths of sin, as we ascend from the depths of our trouble, we too need to patiently wait on the Lord. And we need to wait because our soul needs to be readied to hope in the Lord, to find joy in Him. And our soul is made ready by waiting on God because as we wait on God, a longing for Him grows in us. And as we wait on God, Our waiting not only displays, but it also grows a hunger for God. As we wait on God, our waiting displays and grows also our reliance solely upon Him. As we wait on God, that reliance upon Him will grow and grow in us. One one guy says this, Matthew Henry, he says, I wait for the Lord. From Him I expect relief and comfort, believing it will come, longing till it does come, but patiently bearing the delay of it and resolving to look for it from no other hand. My soul does wait. I wait for him in sincerity and not in profession only. I am expectant and it is for the Lord that my soul waits. Sums it up well. But what should our waiting look like? Well, the psalmist shows as well. He gives us another picture here to show what our waiting needs to look like and that kind of urgency and craving that needs to be in our waiting because our waiting is to look like watchmen, he says there in verse 6. Watchmen. We are to be certain and waiting like watchmen. Back then, watchmen would stand on the walls of the cities or in towers looking out for danger looking out for what was coming, looking for enemies. And they would, they would really long for the morning because in the night, dangers could be hidden. Dangers could be lurking, easily creep up. But when morning comes, everything would be revealed. Things couldn't go unnoticed when the morning comes. And so they would wait expectantly and long for the safety that morning would bring. And when we are going through the dark 
times of distress, the night times of despair. It can feel endless. It can feel like no end is in sight. But like watchmen, we must remember, morning is certain. The morning will come. The sunrise of hope in God will appear at God's appointed time. And we wait for that and we long for that eagerly. Just like the psalmist in Psalm 73 says this, he says, showing this eager longing for God. Whom have I in heaven but you? There is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart, my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. The kind of waiting we are to have here is a waiting on God with an eagerness, waiting for God alone, because apart from Him, him we have no good thing as the psalmist says in Psalm 16. Apart from Him, we have no good thing. And so we are to eagerly wait on the Lord because He is all we need. He is what satisfies. And how do we do that? How do we wait on the Lord? Well, we see it in verse 5. There's another connection in verse 5 that shows us. And it's the connection between waiting on the Lord and hoping in His Word. Can you see that there in verse 5? I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in His Word I put my hope. This waiting isn't just a waiting of sitting back, being silent, but it's a waiting in God's Word. It's a hoping in God's Word. It's a diligent, disciplined waiting that hopes in God's Word. Because through God's Word, we grow in confidence of who God is, and of His character, and of His promises. And that's what readies us to have hope in Him, and to rely on Him. This is why we must listen to God's Word. We must be in God's Word and we must focus on it as we're waiting for God and as we're crying out to Him. Otherwise, no answer will come. The light instead comes when we are in God's Word. The light of God's answers come in His Word, in the light of His Word. And so we must wait in His Word. If we are to grow in assurance and have hope and joy, We must wait in His Word to see God and who He is and hear His promises. And then finally, how do we climb out of the depths? There's a fourth point here. We see in verse 7 and 8, how do we climb out of the depths to this peak of assurance and joy and hope? Well, the fourth point in verse 7 and 8, we see we need to confidently hope in the Lord. Here in that mountain climbing picture, we finally reach the peak the peak of assurance and a certain hope in God. Have a look at verse 7 and 8. It says, O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with Him is full redemption. He Himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. See that call at the beginning? O Israel, God's people, Christians, hope in the Lord. Put your hope in the Lord. This is the opposite of verse 1, what the psalmist was in. The depths, now he is hoping in God and he's calling out now for all of Israel to hope in God as well. Verse 1 to 6, were an individual, at an individual level, the psalmist speaking. But here in verse 7, it shifts and he's calling for all of Israel to join him as well. This is how sure his hope in the Lord is. And he's able now, because of that deep hope he has in the Lord, he's able to call all of God's people to it because he's progressed through these steps to hope in the Lord. And why does he have this confident assurance in God? It's very clear in the verse, isn't it? In verse 7, why does he have this confident hope in God? Why does he call for Israel to hope in God? Because God has steadfast love and with Him is plentiful redemption. Do you see the the connection there? Who God is, what He is like, His character, that is the grounds for the psalmist's hope. Who God is and His character and what He is like is the grounds for our hope and joy and assurance. So what do we see here about God? Well, firstly, we see He has steadfast love. He has unfailing love. What is that? Well, it's God's firm, promised, covenantal love to His people. It's an immovable, unchanging love that He shows 
and that he assures to his people. And it's a love that assures us of a future hope and an eternal joy with him. That's his steadfast love, his unfailing love. But also we know and see here about God that he has full redemption, plentiful, abounding redemption. What's redemption? What's God paying for the penalty of sins, past, present and future? Redemption is that someone being set free because that price is paid. Typically in the Bible, picturing a slave being set free and redeemed when the price is paid. For the psalmist, he doesn't though have clarity on how that redemption comes. We do. We now, looking back, know how we have redemption, how that price has been paid. And we know it's through God's Son, don't we? We have freedom and we have redemption. Freedom from slavery to sin because of Jesus' blood. There's a few verses in Colossians that I love that really show this. Colossians 1, verse 13 to 14 says, God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And then in the next chapter, verse 13 and 14, it says, God made us alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This He set aside, nailing it to the cross. That's, there's a great picture of redemption. Christ, by His substitutionary death, has redeemed us. He's paid the debt we owed. He's set aside the debt for good by nailing it to the cross. He paid for it with His blood and we are redeemed now and free from the slavery to sin. And it's a plentiful redemption. It is sufficient for all our sin, past, present and future. It's plentiful, it's full and complete because of what Christ has done. And so this is why we can have a firm hope, like the psalmist calls for at the beginning of verse 7, because of who God is. Because He has unfailing love and plentiful, abounding redemption. And this is what grounds our hope. This is what leads us to having a confident hope in the Lord. Not circumstances. Our hope and our joy isn't bound up in circumstances. The psalmist, in verse 1, is in the depths. He's not in a good situation. He's not in a great time. That's not why he has joy and hope in God, because he's having a great time. He's in the depths, but even in the depths, he comes to a point where he hopes in God and where he calls for God's people as well to join in and worship God, because he has a deep hope and joy in the Lord, even in the depths. And when we have that kind of hope, it is a freeing and awesome thing. It sets us free to worship and serve the Lord. It sets us free to soar. As Isaiah says, Isaiah 40, 31, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. Those who hope in the Lord. So this here, this psalm shows how we rise from those valleys of despair those depths of difficulty that we face and how we rise up to the mountain peak of hope in the Lord and joy in Him. This is what we need to do. I don't know what depths you're in. I don't know what trouble you're facing in particular at the moment, but I do know that these things here, these things are God's good design for how we rise up in those depths and in that difficulty. In the depths you are facing, this is what you need to do. You must cry to the Lord. You must cry out to Him. You must confess your sin and find forgiveness. You must crave for God's work, for God to work. And you must confidently hope in the Lord and in His character, who He is. This is how, this is how we deal with sin. This is how we deal with sin in our life, but this is how we deal with all trouble that we face. So make these things a habit in your life. And together, let's rise up from the depths that we will face again and again and again in life. And let's ascend 
to the joy and hope that is found in Jesus. Let's rise up to that point, to that mountain peak of joyful assurance in God, because it is at that point that we are then able to freely serve Him and worship Him. So let's rise up to that. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word and we thank You for Your Son and the plentiful, abounding redemption that we have, the salvation that we can have through Him. And I pray, God, for any tonight who don't know that plentiful redemption, who haven't had their debt paid, who haven't put their faith in Christ and in His death, I pray for them, God, right now that You would burden them with their sin, that they would see they cannot stand before You. And I pray, God, that they would confess their sin and see that they need to run to You for forgiveness. And they need to run in faith to Christ to be saved. And I pray for all of us, God, who have experienced this plentiful redemption in Christ, who have seen your steadfast love and seen it day in and day out. I pray, God, that you would cause us to have a deep hope in you, that you would help us to rise up from the the depths that we often face, the difficulties that we often face and rise up still in these times to hoping in you and joyfully serving you, God. Please equip us for this so we can be your servants and effective for your kingdom. And we pray all of this for your glory. Amen.